funcionario de ASA. Are we live? All right. Look at that. Huh. Welcome, folks. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? I didn't know that we were going to be live already. I'm sitting over here. But uh, so uh, a bunch of you just got to watch the video that I think is the coolest reintroduction story of my lifetime. And I was born in 1964, so that's a pretty long time. The Kentucky elk reintroduction, there's never been as large of a, of a, we call it relocation or translocation of wildlife anywhere on the North American continent manually like we had in Kentucky. And now we have all of these elk east of the Mississippi in this place that it was endemic, right? There, there were elk there for forever and forever and now they're back. I think it was in the 1840s is when Kentucky thought that their elk herd kind of disappeared from the landscape. And we all read about Daniel Boone and others going across the Cumberland Gap and what a wildlife uh, place it was. And uh, now here we are. We're, we're looking at well north of 10,000 elk in Kentucky. Uh, probably more than 13,000 elk in Kentucky. And uh, it's something we should celebrate. So you got Kentucky uh, Fish and Wildlife Agency, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, a bunch of volunteers, a bunch of partners. It, it, it's just, in my mind, the classic example of conservation in action. It is hands-on, let's go do this, let's put our shoulder to the wheel, and make sure this happens, and it does. And now Kentucky gives away a lot of elk hunting tags. Kentucky is the source of the, the relocation stock for all the other eastern states. It's known to be free of CWD, thankfully, at least for the time being. So the, the location and, and moving of elk is considered safer because of its CWD-free status. So. There's all these things that are so cool about Kentucky in this elk hunting story. For me, I apply every year, but the odds of me drawing a tag, yeah, they're probably pretty slim, but you never know. So I hope that all of you are thinking about Kentucky. We, it, right, it, we all wanna go elk hunting somewhere. And here in Kentucky, you think about how many elk there are in close proximity to states with large populations. It's an amazing resource. I mean, we're talking not just the hunting that all of us love, but the wildlife viewing, just the commitment to uh, what I'd call recovery of species for all practical purposes. Elk were extinct east of the Mississippi, or at least in Kentucky, and now they are abundant. The, the interesting part, if you watch the video, you saw how many uh, of these elk or what the recovery area is, but how many elk stay in one place because the habitat is so great. They've had no need to go and expand across the entirety of the, the recovery area. And the, the video has a lot of really good information about how large the recovery area is. Um, how many elk, how many they started with. You know, they started with just over 1,500 elk that came from, I think the majority came from Utah, but then they came from North Dakota, Kansas, Arizona. Uh, I'm, I'm probably missing some states. So they go to, these elk all go to Kentucky in 1997, 25 years ago. That's why we're celebrating this this year. It's been the 25th anniversary. And so now, we end up with this big stock of elk that go to places like Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, 
I mean, <laughs> that's really cool. Even Wisconsin, uh, that already had a small herd of elk, their herd was augmented from the, the elk population in Kentucky. So there's been so much to be excited about. And I think if, if you think, uh, at least in my mind, if we look back and we, you know, as humans, we use these anniversary dates, right? Like 25th year, whatever. Well, looking back 25 years, I don't know that anybody could have believed the recovery of elk in Kentucky would have been as successful as it has been. And that's an amazing state wildlife agency that's committed to it. The national forests down there are committed to it. But here's another big commitment besides the Elk Foundation. It's the fact that over 90% of the land that these elk occupy is private land. So you can't do that without some great private land stewards. And a lot of these are reclaimed mines. And the, those companies, those uh, coal mine companies, we're a huge partner in making this happen. So it is, it's just really, really cool to do, do a, a celebration uh, of what has occurred in 25 years. Now, if you got 10 bucks, I think it's in May is when Kentucky holds their draw. It's only 10 bucks. I mean, I spill more coffee on the floor of my truck in a month than 10 bucks. So I would suggest any of you if you have 10 bucks, go put your name in the hat and maybe your name will get pulled and you'll get to go to Kentucky. It'd be fun if you could. It would be so great. So I'm going to grab some of the questions that all of you are asking here. Uh, yeah, Paul Kemper says that Pennsylvania and Kentucky are in the top of his elk list. Well, I don't think I'll ever draw uh, Pennsylvania, but I'm, I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming about Kentucky. Uh, what are the draw odds? I have no idea what the draw odds are, but whatever they are, they got to be better for you than they've been for me because I remember the first year Kentucky started taking non-resident applications. I thought, oh, I'll sneak in there. No one really knows about it. Well, nope, not yet. <laughs> uh, but, hey, I think a lot of, oh, here, uh, on the, the chat here, we got Stephen Doby. He, Stephen works for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. He's been their eastern, I'm going to say, man in charge, if you want. I'm using the wrong term, Stephen. Sorry about that. Uh, but he's in charge of a lot of these conservation projects, how RMEF does this stuff. And before that, he spent 10 years with the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Agency. So he's chiming in here answering some really good questions. Uh, Let's see, uh, about what the harvest odds were. 33% uh, all the way up to 78%. Uh, that's way, way higher than any of the Western states. 78% is, man, it's a good thing that, that we don't have a 78% success rate in Montana because we sell more tags than there are elk. We'd, we'd be out of elk. Uh, okay, here somebody chimed in and uh, said, uh, Let's see, the deadline to apply is April 30th. Sorry, I, you people are going to think I was just trying to, to better my odds by telling you, oh, apply in May. Uh, Jason just said that the deadline is the 30th, so somebody's pulling it up here. Uh, let's see, this year there's going to be 150 firearm permits, bull, bull firearm. There's going to be 244 antlerless and youth and so there's a map of the Kentucky elk hunting units you'll see that there's seven units uh, six of them are open to hunting wait Jacob says he's been fortunate enough to draw Kentucky and Pennsylvania Jacob how can that be man no way that's that's like crazy uh, let's see uh, David, is, he, Dave always has good questions. He's like, how do calls go out for volunteers in Kentucky? Uh, he gets notices about things in his home state of Illinois. That's, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure, Dave, but RMEF could tell you uh, where that is. You know, this winter, they went and did the, uh, the relocation that you saw in the video. And uh, there's, uh, 
what's Jason saying now? That they announced the results in May, in the May deadline, in May with the deadline to apply on the 30th. Okay. Uh, Jacob is saying, no, it's really true. He thinks I'm in disbelief. I'm sure it's true, Jacob, but man, that is some, that's some clean living there to get that kind of luck going on. Holy cow. I, uh, I'd give anything for, for either of those, let alone both of them. Um, so, let's see. Not County? Oh, Jason must, he's, he must have some inside information there. Uh, he's, he's saying uh, Not County. It's, so, if you go to the Kentucky website, uh, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, uh, they have a whole page dedicated to elk hunting and elk hunting applications, how it works, what the season dates are. I think this year the, the firearm season dates, there's one in late September and there's another in uh, early October. Um, so for 244 of you, you're going to have uh, a really good chance with some amazing season dates. Um, so I, uh, I wonder how many people are uh, over... Oh, here's the season dates right there. Someone put them up on the screen. Somebody... One of you guys must be running the screen over there in a way that I don't have any control over. So, all right, the season dates, there you go. I was right, late September and early October. Uh, the cow season, antlerless, is late November and then early January. Wow, that's an interesting time to have a cow season. And then the archery is uh, early September. Wow, late or, or early December. Hmm, that's interesting. I, uh, that'd be hard in that thick country to, to hunt elk with a bow in December. I think you'd have to do it on tree stands or something. I know it's beyond what my talent level is, but that's setting a pretty low bar to say that it's beyond my talent level. Um, is shed hunting allowed in Kentucky? Hmm. That's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, I, I guess you'd have to go and look. I, I, I think the, there's only a few states where it's not allowed, and those are states that have uh, seasons. I think Utah has a season, Nevada has a season, maybe Colorado, uh, Wyoming has a season on them, but I think it's still allowed within the season dates. Um, so Ben's got a, a really interesting question here. Without being browsers, or, and grassers, how do you narrow down the best habitat for elk that they will strive in? Uh, well, elk are primarily grazers, uh, so they're looking more for grass. But if you watch the video, if you read a lot of stuff of what's going on in Kentucky, those elk are spending a lot of their time in the thick, dense, wooded, hardwood areas, but their best forage is still gonna be in the open areas. Because unlike deer, which are browsers, elk are grazers. And so elk prefer grasses and forbs. They'll, they'll make a living on woody browse, but they're gonna go and select for the best food out there. And the best food for them, in their mind, is always some sort of grass. So that's why you see a lot of habitat manipulation. You see, uh, uh, Train, canopy opening, I guess, is the best way to try to put it, uh, that they're trying to do uh, in uh, that, that part of Kentucky. The Elk Foundation funds a lot of that stuff. I'm trying to remember what the number is. I think the Elk Foundation, the amount they and their partners have put into the Kentucky Elk Project is over $2 million, uh, which is really cool. And for me to have seen this growth, I remember when the Elk Foundation was talking about it as an idea. And I'm like, oh, that seems really cool. But I'll admit being a little bit skeptical of whether or not it would work, in my mind it was like, good luck with that. Well, voila, here they are. Uh, a lot of them. So um, I, I think they had to promise that they'd never get above 10,000 elk in Kentucky to get the sign on by the legislature. Because let's face it, Kentucky has a lot of agriculture. And uh, once you start getting over that, you start getting people saying, hey, wait a second, I think there's more elk than you promised us. Well, 
that's why they have hunting seasons and why they control the numbers and why they're trying to disperse them. Uh, Stephen says uh, Virginia is having its first year, I think what he meant to say is the first uh, elk season. Uh, yeah, so you look over to the east of Kentucky, right? You got West Virginia, North Carolina, and Virginia. And all of those states have signed on to have elk management plans. You go south of Kentucky, you got Tennessee. It's, uh, you know, everybody thinks about uh, the West as being this big, wide open country of where you could have elk. And yeah, elk require a lot of space and a lot of habitat. But if you do it right, Kentucky has proven that you can do this. And you can do it in a really complicated landscape. You can do it with a lot of private land ownership. And besides just the fact of all these elk that are now present in Kentucky, I think what it shows is with enough dedication, enough buy-in, enough thought, you can do some amazing wildlife recoveries that maybe you never dreamed of. So in your head, you start thinking about, okay, how do you, how do you take the Kentucky elk model and maybe you apply it to other locations or maybe you apply it to other species in other locations and the possibilities become almost without limit. Um, so the, the thing I always say is conservation is never cheap. Conservation costs money. And those of you who donate your time or your talent or your treasure, the three T's we call it, that, th this video that we just watched is exactly what, what your, your uh, efforts, your funding uh, results in. And uh, so, oh, somebody chimed in. Uh, I'm a resident of Kentucky and uh, applied to hunt elk and mule deer in Montana and elk in Kentucky. Wish me luck. Guess what? I'm going to wish you all the luck in the world. Something tells me that you have better odds as a non-resident in Montana <laughs> than I'm going to have as a non-resident in Kentucky. But you know what? That's what it should be. Uh, so I, uh, I, I'm thankful that there's elk that we're now competing for, if you want to call it that, tag elk tags that we're competing for. So uh, if you get a chance, I, I hope that you would look into the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Everybody knows I'm a big member, I'm a big fan, as you can see on the, I guess it would be over, over here on my computer, right? Yeah, I still got the logo there, it didn't fall off. Uh, I've been a, a member of the Elk Foundation since 1989. Been a, a life member for I can't remember how long. Uh, and in all, if, if you live in elk country, even elk country in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, besides what we talked about here in Kentucky. If you live in elk country, the footprint of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is on the landscape near you. And they don't go and brag about it. They don't tell everybody about it. In fact, I'm surprised they'd even do a video kind of bragging about their work. They're more bragging about the great volunteers and about the great agency that they partner with, uh, Kentucky uh, Fish and Wildlife. But uh, I, uh, I think if you look around, you're gonna see the footprint of the Elk Foundation. And I hope you'll consider being a member. And if you're really interested, take it to that next level and maybe be a volunteer. And it's pretty easy, rmef.org. That's how hard it is, just go there and uh, you can get on their email list. You can get, you know, signed up for whatever it is you want to do. Uh, we have our event here in Bozeman on April 23rd. Any of you Bozeman people watching, that's, uh, you better act fast because our event, I think we do 450 tickets and they sell out really quick. Uh, but it raises a lot of money. And that money, by the time RMEF matches it with partner dollars, with agency dollars, they usually can leverage their money five, six, seven to one. So your $100 donation to RMEF becomes $500, $600, $700.
and that goes to work on the landscape. So, oh, there you go. Somebody just pulled it up there on the computer. Become a member today. So uh, I hope you would think about it. Uh, so what else we got? Uh, yeah, Steve, Stephen, he makes a really interesting point here is how unique the Kentucky's restoration program is, was the, the number of elk released, over 1,500. When you think about the fact that you can only put so many in one of these livestock trailers that they transport them in, and the guys transporting them, they drove, they, they drove in shifts from all these faraway places like Arizona and Utah because they had to get those elk there. You can't leave elk in a trailer for long periods of time. You know, they, gotta, they need space, they, get, they need water, they need food. So they drove nonstop to Kentucky and opened the door and sent them out on their way. So, uh, so let's see, Aaron says he lives in Pennsylvania. I, I like how you Pennsylvania people, you call it PA. Okay, my wife is from Pennsylvania. Okay, and when she talks to other Pennsylvania people, they talk in code word. They call it PA. Hey, I'm from PA. Oh, yeah. So I get it. You know, it's an easy abbreviation, but I don't tell people, hey, I'm from MT. Yeah. But anyhow, Aaron says that he's from PA, applies every year for five years, and has yet to get drawn. Uh, and now he's thinking about applying in Kentucky. Aaron, do that, and I hope I wish you nothing but good luck. Just just don't take my tag. I'm, I mean, take a tag, but leave one for me. Uh, no, I I I'll tell you this. I I dream of of hunting elk in Kentucky. In fact, I'd give anything to figure out a way that we could do our sweepstakes in Kentucky. I mean, how cool would it be? Every year we do a win a hunt with Randy sweepstakes, right? I wonder if anybody here would want to win an elk hunt in Kentucky. So I'm, I'm putting that on my list of things to try to pull off in the next year or two. And we raise a lot of money in that. Not we, RMEF hosts it. We, we take the people hunting. Uh, we get our sponsors to pitch everything in. RMEF raises a lot of money with that win a hunt with Randy thing. I wonder how it would turn out if it was win a Kentucky elk hunt with Randy. It'd be fun. I'd love to go just as the tag along. I'd, uh, I'd be probably more excited than if I had an elk tag somewhere out here. Um, so let's see. Ben says Kentucky has uh, landowner tags that they give to large landowners. Uh, yeah, I think that was part of the arrangement with these, uh, well, the private landowners, because the elk are going to have an impact and with some of the coal mines and stuff, is there is some sort of program there. Um, the some of them in exchange for access, stuff like that. So um, let's see. Yeah, Mark has a good point. No preference point schemes in Kentucky. I like that. And Kentucky's got a lot going for it. Only 10 bucks to apply. You don't got to buy this license, you know. And uh, when I did one of the other Western states, I had to buy a non-resident, non-refundable $160 license just to apply. Not in Kentucky. No preference point scheme. Lots of elk. Sign me up. Uh, just like Ben said, sign me up. <laughs> oh, David says he'd be all on board with a win a hunt with Randy thing. Uh, Riza says, oh man, that'd be a great idea. Uh, I, I would love to do that. What I wouldn't give to do that. So... The thing that's going on tonight, you know, normally we have probably five to seven hundred people on these live events, but I know what's going on. I got an email this morning from my buddy Corey Jacobson. His season premiere elk episode, his Alaska elk episode, started airing at the same exact time that this aired. Had I known, yeah, we would have coordinated that, but I didn't know. So uh, it's 
you know, is what it is. We're here celebrating Kentucky Yell. Uh, the reintroduction, we're celebrating all of the people who work so hard to make it happen, the organizations, the state agencies. None of this happens just because someone said, oh yeah, I'd like to put some elk over there today. These, these plans, this wildlife strategy, conservation strategy that Kentucky put together took a long time to get it in place. Then they had to get their state government to sign off on it. And they had to adopt a plan. And I think the current plan, the current elk plan that they're operating under, uh, Gabe Jenkins uh, works for Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. He sent me a copy of that uh, this morning. I think that plan runs until 2030. So they're operating under a plan that is in place for another eight years. And then it'll get updated and updated. And so it's a pretty adaptive and dynamic strategy that Kentucky has. And they have to be because they have a very complex landscape that they're trying to manage a very large animal on, right? A herd of elk come through your, your property. They don't say, oh, let me walk around this gate. Let me find the easy way over this fence. Sometimes fences get knocked over. Sometimes crops get knocked over. If you've ever seen an aerial shot of a bull elk in a cornfield, it's like somebody took their, their truck out there and was doing donuts out in that cornfield. So elk aren't necessarily the best, uh, easiest to accommodate neighbors you could have. And when you have a complex landscape like that, you have to work really hard at it. And I think a ton of credit goes to Kentucky for how hard they work at it and what a great job that they're doing with it. So um, let's see, what else we got here? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Robert says that there's been two elk releases in Tennessee. Um, yeah, that's thanks to the work that started in Kentucky. And if you watched the video, you saw how Kentucky said, hey, we're trying to pay it forward for, you know, the fact that Kentucky got their elk from some, somewhere else. Now they want to give their, their elk to other places. So kind of a pretty cool way how it works. Um, but... What else we got? Any other questions here? Uh, let's see. Okay. Jason's asking, what about if you did a quota on elk and the season closes after a quota? Oh, boy. <laughs> I bet you'd have an awful lot of people lined up the first day. Uh, I think that'd be a hard one to implement. Might end up with a lot more harvest than you were thinking about. Um, so, what other ones? <laughs> uh, Nate says, I decided I can watch Corey's Alaska elk hunt and I don't have to watch it live. Let's keep talking about getting lucky in Kentucky. Oh, that's a great, that's a great term you got there, Nate. Getting lucky in Kentucky. I'm talking about elk hunting, getting lucky while elk hunting in Kentucky. When I said that, the camera crew here, I got three of them, Jonathan, Paul, Jace, they all started laughing like, I can't believe you said that, Randy. Well, I, it's, uh, oh well. Did Kentucky have a lot of elk originally, Eric asked. Yes, they did. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows what the population was, but the species endemic, you know, that was originally in Kentucky, was the eastern elk, which is a now extinct species. We had the Merriam's elk in the southwest states of Arizona and New Mexico. That's now an extinct species. So we have two subspecies of elk that were in North America that are gone. We still have Roosevelt elk over on the coast of Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, even southeast Alaska. We have Thule elk in California. We have what's called Manitoba elk, which are in where you would think they would be, right? Manitoba, I believe Saskatchewan. Uh, I think the herd in Northwest Minnesota qualifies as uh, uh, Manitoba elk. And then we have the Rocky Mountain elk, which is the most popular of the subspecies. It's the, the subspecies that is pretty much everywhere in the West and was the, 
the original stock, the uh, repopulated Kentucky. So, uh, Dean asks, is there any chance that RMEF is working with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to expand the elk range here? Um, I'm not sure if they're working with the DNR, uh, Dean, but I know that the Fond du Lac tribe is trying to do that. And I don't know uh, how much the, the state is on board with that. Um, and I'm not exactly sure where that will go, but if the tribe uh, were to be able to do that, and it's up kind of northern Minnesota, just sort of west of Duluth, uh, you, would, you would have a lot of elk moving across the landscape in not too long of a time, just like Kentucky. So those elk wouldn't say, hey, I can't leave the tribal lands. You know, they don't have a, a compass and a GPS. They just go where the habitat takes them. So that would be really cool if a story like Kentucky could be repeated in a place like Minnesota or Wisconsin or expanded in Michigan or, you know, whatever state it is. Imagine if they had elk again in upstate New York. That would be cool. I mean, upstate New York's got some really cool country if you've never been there. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, what if you could expand it in Pennsylvania? How cool would that be? What about the Ohio River Valley and southern Ohio, southern Indiana, southern Illinois? Huh? I, I'm, I'm getting way out on a limb here, but uh, I, any of those intrigue me. Uh, David is asking, what subspecies of elk has the largest body weight? Uh, that would be the Roosevelt elk. Uh, they are significant. Uh, <laughs> they're nothing to mess around with once you got one on the ground. Uh, so, well, let's see. Nate says, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 10 or 15 years the world record elk comes from an eastern state. You know, I wouldn't be surprised either. You think about it, you got mild winters, you don't have predators such as wolves, grizzly bears, uh, you have very controlled season types, and you have unbelievable habitat. You, you have all the things that allow elk to get age on them and express whatever antler growth they could in a maximum kind of optimal setting. So it would not surprise me in the least if Kentucky ends up or some eastern state with a whopper, like so big everyone's like, oh my goodness. Uh, so Chris says he's checking in from Kentucky. Well, thanks for being here, Chris. Appreciate that. Uh, there, Steve just told us that uh, the current Kentucky record was a, a deadhead skull. Netted 416. <laughs> I've never even I've never even seen an elk that big, let alone thought about you know visions of one dancing in my head that I'd ever hang a tag on one or find one out in the woods. But it's uh, it's impressive. Uh, let's see. Daniel says he's a Kentucky resident. Been applying for around 10 years. I feel this year is my year. I hope it is, Daniel. And if you do, I hope that you send us a picture. Uh, I, every year I say this year is my year when I send my money to Kentucky also. But, you know, the, the downside would be is if I drew in Kentucky, everyone would say, wait a second. How is it that this, this Newberg guy, how did he end up with a tag? So, I don't know. I, I hope that all of you get a tag before I get one. Um, I'll probably go to my pine box without a Kentucky elk tag, but that's all right. Just knowing that they are there is enough for me. Um, I'm trying to get back there. Uh, I'm doing a podcast. Those of you who know uh, myself and Corey Jacobson, who is premiering a hunt on YouTube tonight. Don't go watch it. You can watch his later. Uh, Corey and I do the Elk Talk podcast. And we're going to have Gabe Jenkins, the, you know, the guy who leads the information outreach communications uh, part uh, for Kentucky uh, Fish and Wildlife. He's going to be on our podcast. I think we're recording it uh, next week. And by the time it gets edited, sometime in early April, it'll be out. And uh, 
Gabe is an unbelievable resource. Uh, he knows this history just like Steve does. And uh, it's an incredible story. <clears throat> if you're into conservation history like I am, there's probably no story that is going to intrigue you more than the Kentucky elk story because it's in the context of a growing population of a country that has 330 million people. And we're going to take these six, 700 pound animals and we're going to introduce 1,500 of them in this landscape and they're going to grow to, you know, 12, 13, whatever thousand. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm just stunned that, that they pulled it off. And like I said, I, you know, I was, uh, I was a little bit of a skeptic of whether or not they could meet their goals, but it shows what hard work will get you. Uh, oh, uh, they say that Kentucky has, they video the draw. Hmm, that's interesting. Hmm. Well, I guess that's, uh, th that's a cool way to do it. I wonder if every state would uh, video their draw. That way no one could say, hey, I think it was rigged, right? <laughs> Uh, Jaden asked, does Kentucky have a draw or a point system? It has a random draw with no points. So, um, Jacob says, hi, I look forward to watching Corey's Alaska hunt, but I want to watch his first. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Mystic Mac asks if I've ever hunted in Pennsylvania. No, I haven't. Uh, it'd be nice if I could. Uh, <laughs> uh. So then someone's like, well, yeah, but don't forget our turkey hunting. The crew here knows that I'm the world's worst turkey hunter. So you don't got to worry about me messing up your turkey spot. Okay. I don't look for shed antlers and I don't turkey hunt. I spring bear hunt and I fish for walleye. So it, you guys are safe with me. Uh, so, oh, wow. Look at Steve just posted this of how big the elk are getting back there with this lush habitat. Uh, a bull elk was fatally struck with a vehicle outside of the Great Smokies National Park. Uh, the head had to be removed to fit the carcass in the pickup. Then with the head removed, it weighed 998 pounds. <laughs> Oh my gosh, an elk out here, a really big elk, a big bull elk, after they're, you know, with the rut, they're kind of run down. 700 pounds is a whopper here in Montana. You get out to eastern Montana where there's better habitat, better feed, you might get bigger than that. But the mountain elk here, 600 pounds is a big one. 700 is like, whoo, boy, I got big Hank here. I can't even imagine 900 and so almost a thousand pounds. Wow, that would be crazy. Uh, one guy says we need some elk hunting in North and South Carolina. Well, you're getting elk. They're starting to grow over there in the western part of North Carolina. Um, I don't know well, how long you'll, it'll be before you actually have a season. Uh, but there's a lot of really committed people working on that in North Carolina. And I hope, I hope that someday you guys get that uh, opportunity. Uh, so Ben's saying, will I be at uh, Mountain Fest, uh, that elk camp in Park City, Utah this summer? And he comments that it's an amazing event. Yes, it is. Uh, and I'll be there. Corey will be there. Uh, I think they're trying to rope me in to uh, doing the uh, the MC of the elk calling contest again. Uh, I'd love doing that. I love going there because there's so many people who are like-minded. And by that, I mean they're just passionate and committed to the idea of conservation. Wild places, wild things. There's, you know, thousands of people converge on Park City, Utah for three or four days. And it's just a ton of fun. I mean, it... Yeah. Yeah, if you get a chance, sign up and go there. Um, so, oh, Jason also mentions that Kentucky Fish and Wildlife does a great job and that in addition to being a top three turkey state on top of being a great elk state, uh, it's also a top three whitetail state. 
Hey guys, what do you think about moving this operation to Kentucky? They're like, mm, maybe. And one of them went just like this. I think because it'd probably be a whole lot easier to buy a house there than it is in Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Matthew and Dave pointed out that the elk that uh, Steve's talking about that got hit by a vehicle, a 998-pound elk, that would be like hitting a moose. I mean, it, you're, you're not, your vehicle is going to need an awful lot of repair work if that happens. So, but. Well, what else we got? Uh, <laughs> so the one guy says, Randy, I'm in Montana for work. When the heck is it going to warm up out here? Guys, what was it, 48 degrees today? I saw a bunch of people in their shorts today. So this, this person from, he says, Coastal Carolina Living, uh, this, is, this is pretty warm for this time of year. <laughs> uh, Someone's asking if I've ever muzzleloader hunted. I have. Uh, I've taken a mule deer in Nevada and three whitetails in Montana, but I, I don't do a lot of it. Uh, I'm just, I'm not good at it. And uh, <laughs> I try to, at my point in life, I'm trying to just st stay in my lane, right? There, there's, I'm below average at everything, but I, I'll stick to the things I'm closer to average on and not the things I'm way below average. So uh, David's asking how the moose meat was. Oh, it's amazing. I do like it better than elk. I know that sounds like blasphemy, but the grain and texture is, the grain and tech is a little bit bigger, so the texture is a little bit smoother, and it's, it's almost got a sweet taste to it. it. It reminds me of a great big chunk of antelope almost with the sweetness and the, and the mellow taste to it. So, uh, Dave says he's finally going to draw New Mexico this year. Dave, I hope you do. <clears throat> and if you do, call me because I'll be looking for an excuse to go to, to New Mexico. I don't know if it'll work on my calendar, but I would try to be there. Uh, least I could do for, for a guy like you. Um, so how are we doing, guys? You think we've covered all of this Kentucky elk story? Or should we just wait till Corey's done with his Alaska hunt and then everybody can come over here? Or maybe I should go over there and type on Corey saying, hey, everybody come over to here. That would have not been nice. I thought about it, Corey, but I'm like, I wouldn't do that to a good friend like you. Corey is a huge supporter of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation also. So uh, we're, uh, we're always excited when we can do anything that, that helps the cause of elk other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. In other words, I just recited the mission of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. You'd say, you'd probably wonder if I've recited that a time or two. Uh, so Nick wants to know if we got any upcoming Arizona hunts. I don't, but Uncle Larry got an elk tag. He lives in Scottsdale, Arizona, so he drew elk as a resident this year. Nobody on our team drew. Not a, we, not a single person here drew elk in Arizona again this year. But Uncle Larry's there, so if Uncle Larry's there, count on a whole lot of humor. We'll probably have to, whoever edits that is going to have their work cut out for them. But you know what? If, if Everybody needs an Uncle Larry in, in their life. So... Um, so let's see, Jaden asks, if I've ever read the book 30 Years a Hunter. I've not, Jaden. I might have to look that one up. Um, let's see, Drew is asking if we're coming to Colorado this year. You know, that's a good question. Marcus has 10 deer points. Matthew has nine deer points. Uh, we could be there. Don't, don't be looking for us, but we might show up there. Um, Denise says, yeah, Uncle Larry, that hunt will be awesome. I can absolutely assure you it will be. Uh, <laughs> if, if his demeanor is anything like when I told him he drew the tag, because he, he's just, I don't want to say oblivious, he's got other things going on. So I text him, I'm like, Larry, you drew elk this year. He called me. And uh, it was a rather colorful phone call. <laughs> he gets pretty excited, so I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when we actually go on the hunt. 
south. Uh, <clears throat> so Nate's saying Corey really hyped the Alaska hunt and how easy the terrain was. Yeah, he's lucky he didn't break his leg and get hurt uh, or worse. Uh, so Mystic Max says, would be a great conservation story if they brought elk back to the east in big numbers. Well, that's what we're celebrating here. I, I'm not sure what you mean by big numbers, but Kentucky having 12,000 elk, that's, that's what we're celebrating today. That's, that's big numbers to me. Uh, but uh, Robert, he's, he's got turkey on the brain. 11 days till Tennessee turkey season. And it'll be a bonus to find a shed elk antler. Yeah, it probably would be. And then if you're like me, you'll hang it in a tree, right? The camera crew, the, I hang them in a tree, and they look at each other like, you think you'll notice if we grab that elk antler when he leaves? And I always tell them, you'll lose your job if you show up and camp with that elk antler on your pack. That, there's a story behind that that... Uh, Someday, uh, we'll tell you the whole story behind me hanging them in trees. Um, oh, <laughs> someone said, looking forward to your next hunt in Mexico. I'm not going to Mexico. I've been in jail in Mexico. I ain't going back there. Nope. Mm -mm. Now, New Mexico, I'd love to go there. But uh, So John has a really good question. Randy, is Texas an option for repopulation of elk anytime soon? Yes, and it's happening, but it's happening, as you know, Texas is mostly private land. Uh, and it's happening way over in West Texas. There are some ranches there that are trying to bring elk back that were endemic to that part of Texas at one time. So there is a program going on there. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to be structured. Texas has definitely a, a different way and, and strategy of, of how they do uh, tag allocations and stuff like that, but it is definitely happening in Texas, uh, but it's just about exclusively on private land by the private land owners. So, oh, let's see. Nick wants to know more about that elk shed story. Yeah, we'll save that for another day. So, uh, so someone says, speaking of books, when will the book that, and this is the book I always tell people to buy, Elk and Elk Ecology, when will it be cheaper than $400? Uh, I hope it's someday soon. You'd have to talk to the folks at the Wildlife Management Institute. They have the copyright on it. Chris, if you're listening, he knows that I have offered to pay them a royalty if they'd give me the digital copyrights. Then we could distribute this thing. Until then, not happening. Oh, yeah, this is another thing. Uh, I think Steve makes an unbelievable point here. And he said, I'd be remiss if I didn't illustrate the, po the positive impact elk have had for all hunters in Kentucky. And they have this LAP, Landowner Access Program. That program has opened up, what did he say, 241,000 acres of private land to public hunting. So... That's a lot of acreage from some really good cooperating landowners. So that's, I think that's a really important part to emphasize. Uh, <laughs> uh, ben says, tell the elk shed story. Did someone shoot thinking the antler was an elk? No. This story goes back a long time. Uh, it goes back to where I grew up in Minnesota. One of my friends, he didn't hunt, but he used to walk around in the woods with me. Well, it was Peter Rollo, uh, Peter, his brother Mark. They have both since passed. Uh, and they were enrolled members of a Chippewa tribe. And very seldom did you find a shed antler in Minnesota because the rodents would eat it before you'd ever find it. And, uh, but when we did find one, Peter would hang it in a tree and he'd say, now we're going to have good luck. So whenever I see a shed antler, I think of my now departed buddy Peter. And so I hang an antler in a tree and I think about him. And I hope that he was right, that it was going to bring me good luck. So that's, that's the story behind me hanging shed antlers in trees and why I tell people, whatever you do, don't take that antler. So there, we told this story. But uh, 
So <laughs> Armando says, Randy, if we drew the New Mexico Unit 34 archery tag, would you like to come down? Uh, I always like coming to New Mexico. The downside is my September looks like a train wreck right now. Um, but you never know. Uh, we do get an awful lot of requests, people saying, hey, I drew this tag, I drew that tag. Would you come down? Would you, would you join us? You want to film it? Um, and uh, a lot of times it, it doesn't always work. Uh, our calendar is just a mess. So Heath says, my daughter will be attending Montana State University for the next four years. So what would be the best month to pay her a visit and have a chance to put some meat in the freezer? September if you're an archery hunter, October and November if you're a rifle hunter. So there's, there's some uh, venison, some meat running around the hills here in Montana. Uh, our deadline in Montana, though, is April 1st. So you got, what, 10 days, something like that, uh, to get ready. Uh, so what do you say, folks? We, we good enough here or we got... We got more questions that I need to get to, um, but uh, oh, hey, let me see. <laughs> uh, I think we've covered all the questions. Am I missing any guys? So yeah, I think we've got it covered. But anyhow, thanks to Armia. Thanks to Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. Thanks to Steve for being here. Uh, thanks for all of you to be here. And if you get a chance, go watch the video that RME have put together celebrating the 25 years of doing this. Um, it's, it's just a, a remarkable story. It's a story not worth just, well, it's worth celebrating, but also worth trying to replicate. And I know that sounds really ambitious. I know that sounds like a dream, but guess what? Somebody had a dream about putting elk in Kentucky. And uh, if I remember right, I think one of the big people pushing that was Tom Baker, if I remember right. Uh, he was the former chairman of the Kentucky Game and Fish, or Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, amazing that it, that it happened. And we're all the beneficiaries of a whole lot of hard work by a lot of people. So when you get a chance, thank those people. And if you get a chance, become, become a member of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Good evening.